Hello everyone, welcome to this corner of the studio. This tutorial is going to be about one of the biggest challenges I've had in my recent paintings. Something that is very different from the rest of my studio projects and probably one of the more unusual projects I've taken on. Unusual for many different reasons. Last year and the year before that I travelled to Mexico to the Sea of Cortez to experience what it's like to swim with sea lions. I joined a group of photographers uh, who are divers, who are intent on improving their skills as underwater photographers. And as a non-photographer, I joined them as a snorkeler and mainly concentrated on trying to draw these animals underwater. So how do we go from this to this. Having trained within the traditional framework of academic painting, I wasn't necessarily prepared for what I was about to embark on. So far, any project I completed involved having a model in the studio, organizing the lighting, orchestrating the background, choosing a costume, and usually based on some sort of theme that I developed personally. I would start and finish the whole project with everything in place working essentially always from life. And for my landscapes, I would go outside and hunt down that atmosphere I was looking for and go and meet my subject firsthand. Regardless of the different subjects I was taking on, one thing was for sure that I was always going to be working from life, looking directly at it moving around it, working out all the different angles, all the different problem areas. I've always regarded this as an absolute necessity, especially when studying. After my studies, however, if ever I was forced out of this luxury of working from life, for example, um, needing to work from a photograph, not only did I feel that the process was not as enjoyable, but I felt the whole process lacked the sort of full palette of feelings that you get by interacting with someone in person. Some might say it's being dogmatic or being purist, but really, there's no substitute for the real thing. So it seems like I've got a long list of habits that I need to stick to. In the studio, I've got my lighting, I've got my model, everything is stable, we've got a schedule going, everything is sort of under control. And everything is still, and everything is dry, and I'm wearing my normal clothes. So in this project I set myself, how was I going to manage with all this? And how was I going to fight my conscience with this element of not being able to work all the time from life, and ultimately having to improvise some parts that are going to make this task much more difficult than I expected? I've drawn animals before, um, I've drawn moving animals before, but usually that's in a comfortable setting where I can sit down somewhere, have my sketchbook on my lap, and draw and rub out and correct and improve, and have all the time in the world to finish off a drawing. But here, none of that was going to be possible. First I realized I was going to have to be drawing underwater, and I certainly wasn't going to be going underwater with my sketchbook, so I had to find a solution there. Drawing underwater is not necessarily unheard of. You have underwater uh, engineers, you have underwater archaeologists, who sometimes need to take notes underwater. For example, an archaeologist may actually do a drawing of an excavation site. And I've even seen this, uh, this stuff in my local dive shop. There are little slates about this big that attach onto your arm with a little pencil attached. But everywhere I looked, I couldn't find anything big enough. And really what I needed was something... What I needed really was something as big as my smallest landscape panel. Uh, about 20 by 30 centimeters. So after a lot of research, I worked out my best option was going to be plexiglass, sort of acrylic panel, opaque, and I was going to have to try and draw on this. But unfortunately, the pencil couldn't make any marks on this. There was no bite to the surface. And my pencil, in any case, I wasn't too sure that was going to survive very long in the seawater. It's probably going to start rusting and start jamming up. So. That wasn't going to be a good option. 
But what is waterproof is wax. So I went to find myself some little wax crayons, and they work pretty well. They leave a mark on these, but the only thing is, it's not permanent. This comes off, it would get rubbed off, it wouldn't work underwater. So I had to get another sort of surface to this, uh, to this acrylic panel, and to do that, I would have to sand it. So by sanding it down, I actually give this, uh, this texture a little bit more of a matte finish, and it has a bit of bite to it now so that any line that I put down actually stays and can't come off. So now I've got my waterproof wax crayon. I've got my acrylic panel sanded down to have more of a bite. But the thing is I discovered through this is that even though the drawing will remain intact, I realized that as I draw, I can't correct any of my lines. So anything I put down has got to be right first go. I've got to commit to it, and that's going to be pretty difficult. On top of this, I'm floating in the water, I've got my head underwater, I'm trying to breathe through a snorkel, I'm facing uh, the waves that are making me bob around, I've got currents moving me around, I've got the unpredictable nature of the animals that I'm trying to draw. I don't have an assistant to hand me the materials, I don't have a comfortable working sort of situation, and how do I avoid any of my stuff dropping to the bottom of the sea? So what I had to do was I drilled a little hole in the corner of each panel. Through this I would put a little metal ring. Attached to that would be a leash that would then come and wrap itself around my wrist. So I had my panels attached to my left arm and on my right arm I would have another ring and a leash going this time to this small bag. And in this bag is where I would store all my wax crayons. So that way I could have everything under my control. If anything happened, if anything unexpected led me to drop anything out of my hands, it wouldn't float away, it would just stay attached to me. So now that I've got everything safely attached, all I had to do was basically float there and draw. But the thing is, we've got a few other elements that come into play here. So we have the panel that I've got to hold on to. I've got my wax crayon, which I've got to hold on to. My body is moving around, floating about in the waves. The current is moving this panel, as it's quite a big piece of plexiglass, and sort of drags a lot. Then I have this arm that I'm trying to draw with, that's also floating about in the water. So I've got these three elements that I'm also trying to control, and work out how to draw. And on top of that, I have a model that will not stop moving, and will just do all sorts of unpredictable movements. So it didn't really matter to me how unlikely I was going to manage all this, but I figured I just had to have a go. If I got too frozen or too nervous about the fact that these drawings were going to be too difficult to do, then I was never going to find out if this was even going to be possible. So um, we'll start off with the work in the field or in this particular case, in the water. I'm going to start off with the drawings I actually did in the field. These are drawings that I did underwater. These are very quick drawings. So in preparation for this kind of idea, uh, the best thing to do is go to the zoo. Start with cats, because they sleep a lot. Then move on to things like giraffes or zebras. Um, here the penguins are moving very quickly, just keeping a sense of the rhythm of the animal, just not trying to be too precise, but mainly just trying to capture the essence of their gesture, their movement, their attitudes. Sometimes the animals stay a little bit more still, sometimes they're moving back and forth. But this is basically the practice that I got into to be prepared in the face of a complete hyperactive moving animal like sea lions. Uh, some drawings, well here we go, my love for dinosaurs obviously has to come through. These are more static drawings, just a lengthy process to analyse the gesture and all the different attitudes that you can start picking up on all, all the different movements of the bones. It's all about trying to get the attitude and the gesture of the animal as opposed to creating a really carefully modeled drawing with light and shadow. Quite quick drawings, not giving myself too much time. I'm actually trying to limit myself 
with every drawing to maybe 10 minutes, uh, sometimes five minutes. And these are uh, drawings from movement. These are horses preparing for a race. Getting uh, various different positions and attitudes, becoming familiar basically with the animal and becoming familiar with the process of not being too precious about a drawing. These are really accumulation of drawings to become accustomed with the rhythms of the animal. At no point in these drawings am I thinking of a composition of a painting yet. These are basically studies which I trust will come in useful later at the studio when I finally decide on composing something specific. I will be drawing just absolutely everything. Sea lion resting on the rock, sea lion playing around with uh, starfish. They really harass starfish, it's hilarious. They just pick them up and just throw them about and then let them drop to the bottom of the sea. Napping sea lions, super active, sweeping movements of sea lions through the water. Here's one sort of coming up to the surface, I think, just floating. Accumulating knowledge, um, accumulating information, just as I would be doing in a sketchbook. So this is probably the first day I was drawing. Before I got in with the sea lions, so I, I swam with sea lions the first day, just to become accustomed to what the, um, what the situation was, what the currents felt like, what the temperature of the water was like. So I didn't draw the first day. The second day we went to a coral reef, which didn't necessarily have that many sea lions there, but there was a lot of fish life. So this was my first attempt at getting used to my materials. Got a mix of stuff here. For example, here I'm actually drawing out the silhouette of the little canyon in the coral reef with a few little fish taking shelter. Had a bit of time just to sort of shade in one side to, to create a sense of uh, volume. I would hold this in all sorts of various positions to get different drawing, uh, different impressions of different fish. So we've got the sergeant majors from the top of the surface. looking at them sideways, looking at them from the top, looking down. Here we've got needlefish, looking from the side. Uh, Pufferfish here, oceanic triggerfish, I think is the name of that one. So just to give you an idea of how you draw on these, you basically have no chance of rubbing out. So you have a line that just comes down and then you can't rub that away at all. So you can have a thin line, you can have a thick line. You can't, you can't correct anything you draw. You just have a go and hope that some of the drawings on your panel, panel will be useful later on. Here's some more studies of fish, then moving on to sea lions here. This was a good introduction to drawing the sea lions because they were napping. The whole family quite relaxed floating, they just float like this at the surface with their eyes closed and occasionally opening them just to see where you are, then they close them again. Here are some more movement ones, uh, double-sided. Here's a sea lion flying past with uh, throwing out some bubbles. So from this stage, these I pack up in my suitcase. They're waterproof. Nothing, nothing rubs, uh, nothing rubs off. So they're quite resistant to travel. So I bring all these back to the studio and set them up. I have a go at selecting which drawings I feel could be used in uh, composition. So I've got the drawings. I've studied the subject up close. I've actually witnessed the whole phenomenon in front of my eyes. I have a whole week's worth of drawings and gesture studies, and my mind is full of potential compositions. And here I take my favorites and put them over to the sketchbook. And still I need to decide how all this process is going to sort of work together. And how am I going to battle this sort of conundrum of working out how only part of this project has been worked from life and how do I fill in the rest of the gaps? So I found the best way to try and bridge that gap of not being able to work all the way through the project from life 
was to rely on some of the footage that I filmed myself underwater. So when I was sketching, I was drawing with the panels and then attached to the panels, pointing forward towards my subject, uh, was attached to a little underwater camera. So that way I could basically film the stuff I was drawing and if I missed anything, I could then look at that later and hopefully that could maybe fill in some of the gaps. So that footage I would play back for myself in the studio. I'd set up a screen, I'd set up a projector, and this, I felt, was the only way I was going to be able to get back into the atmosphere. So I sat here, rewatched some of the videos, tried to fill in some of the gaps that I may not have been able to achieve in some of the drawings I was doing underwater. The advantage of working from film, and obviously also especially working from life, is that you're in front of your subject, you see the animal leading into the position that you were choosing to draw, and then you see the animal also leaving that position. And what you're left with is a much fuller picture of what that animal is doing. So this stage, I accumulate some drawings from life and bring them into my sketchbook. So here you can see already these two here are the same drawing. And I accumulate all my favorites from my panels into my sketchbook. So the next stage, after having established all my favorites, is I go over the footage that I had uh, film myself and find moments where I could put them, put the uh, the footage on a loop and watch the film and draw from the film as if I was back in the water. So my equipment was pretty minimal. I just had a couple of uh, small, very portable uh, mini cameras. From those, I can then watch the scenes again and try and capture some of the movements of the of the sea lions, but this time filling them out a little bit more, finding a bit more form, and seeing which ones could lend themselves to create a, a composition of some sort. What's very important in this particular area is the sardines. The sardines are an integral part of the scenery there. When you get underwater, that's pretty much all you see. It's almost like a conveyor belt of sardines just going round and round this island, creating all sorts of interesting forms, interesting sort of nebulous sort of clouds, they're an important part of any composition that I was going to make because they really are the, um, the sort of background of any scene. So here, here I'm already starting with, a, with an attempt for a composition. So I'm finding a spot in the, in the area where I was drawing the sea lions where a couple of, couple of cliffs come in from both sides and just sort of frame the picture. So here's another sketchbook where I also explored some of the compositional ideas. So starting off with things like here with a few sea lions floating about, continuing with more small versions, pretty quick little drawings, not, not being too precise about anything, trying to see what the format would be, trying to see how the uh, movement of the eye would be going through the composition, focusing on this loop that would be going in a sort of a, a figure of eight so for the, for the sardines, I'm watching the, the footage from my filming that I did on site and playing it in a loop again to try and observe how they move, how they move when they're undisturbed, how they move when they are disturbed, when they're chased, and moving through more and more selections of what poses I'm going to be doing for the sea lions, and then moving into finding something a little bit more specific for the actual composition and just repeating over and over again the process and finding a way to feel comfortable with something that's going to function as a picture. So the sea lions are obviously an integral part of the, the painting, but what was exciting, the last time I went, I spotted cormorants that actually turned up and were swimming around chasing the sardines as much as the sea lions were. These, this was a great opportunity to add a second character to the composition. These are amazing, amazing birds. They, you know, they're designed for flight, they have feathers, and somehow they spend their time swimming underwater chasing their food down there. When sea lions or cormorants start chasing sardines, the sardines start creating all sorts of fascinating shapes. So, next stage, after establishing and being happy with this composition, is I'm going to make a big version of it. 
so that's going to be in charcoal on a big format and that's where we're going to go to the easel so the next stage after the compositions from my sketchbook I then enlarge those and I enlarge them up to a large version such as this so at this stage what I'm trying to do is explore the drawing a little bit more finding the tonal ranges working out the proportions of each animal, each protagonist, working out how the sardines are going to be interacting with the sea lion. And I'm pretty, pretty secure at this point of what the composition is going to be. I know the framework, I know where they're placed, I know where the water um, column is going to be placed, where the surface is going to be, how deep we're going to be looking down into the, into the composition. But before, before I move from this into the large painting, I need to work out a little bit more of what the colour is going to be. And this is where we have to focus on the colour study. Now with the, with the colour study, these are done relatively small. This is another panel that's about 25 by 35 centimetres. I spend maybe two or three days on this, and I'm not focusing so much on the accuracy of the design. The, the, uh, the sardines, for example, are quite, quite general, little dots just sort of suggesting where they're going to be. The main energy spent in these colour sketches is not to do with drawing or working out the proportion, it's mainly to do with working out how the tones are going to function and where the colours are going to be. So when I, when I transferred it, just a word on the, the transfer process, I simply just had the drawing up next to my canvas the, the format is a little bit different, so it's a little bit more narrow in the drawing, a little bit wider in the painting, which I felt actually gave a little bit more breathing space to the sardines, gave a bit more breathing space also for this anchor of the coral reef here on the, on the left, and um, allowed also the sea line to take up a, a bit more space on the, uh, the centre of the, the painting, and it could, it could allow me to actually make that sea line a little bit bigger. The sardines were a big part of this painting, obviously. That's why, that's why I made sure that I made a, made a proper colour sketch to work out how the sardines were actually going to appear um, when they're reflecting light and when they're in shadow and also the parts when they're disappearing. But actually the sea lion takes up a, quite a small portion of the canvas, even though it's the, it's the, the, the part that I want people to home in on. Um, you still have to make sense of how the background is moving. You have this strange phenomenon that really, you know, the individual little animals, uh, each individual fish, when they're in a, in a ball, they start creating almost like a new animal. They, they have a sort of a, a new identity in themselves just by massing together. So obviously that's what happens when they, when they school together um, in that sort of uh, classic fashion. And the tricky thing for me with this was that sea lions can actually be quite predictable in the sense that they're always going to look the same shape. But ultimately a sea lion always looks like a sea lion. A sardine always looks like a sardine, but a group of sardines can look like anything. When you've got too many options, you, you run the risk of never really being able to set down a particular design. The way I got around that was I, first of all, I remember how the sardines looked when I was swimming there and I made mental notes of what shapes were aesthetically pleasing and which ones were not necessarily going to be uh, helpful in a painting. I only stuck to one particular area where the, um, where the sardines were swimming, and that is in this very specific archway where they would get in this little zone where they would just be contained uh, in a very specific shape. But within this archway, the sardines had a framework that contained their their movements to a certain uh, to a certain range. I stuck to that particular area. That all that all gets done in your sketchbook. If you leave all those sort of big decisions for when you're doing the painting or when you're doing when you're doing this drawing, um, you're going to have a really hard time completing any particular decision because you're you're treating such a large area that you're going to have to modify constantly it's a much more practical to be modifying things in your sketchbook.
there are so many different versions of this painting that I could make. It conveys a portion of what I experienced there. This was never one particular scene that ever existed uh, in front of me. It's an amalgamation of different experiences which I put into one single frame. It's, a, it's an advantage that I have as a painter as opposed to a photographer uh, because I can, I can make choices of bringing in what I want into a painting and showing a scene that is um, believable on the one hand but at the same time is a complete invention because this scene never happened. It's a possibility, it's within the realm of possibility that this scene could happen somewhere. Um, but I never witnessed it as such, but I witnessed several occasions during the whole week that enabled me to actually come up with something that uh, ultimately is something to convey the essence and the feeling and the experience of being in a place and seeing something um, so amazing. That's the end of this process video. I hope it all made sense. If you've got any questions, you can submit them to the Classroom platform. And if you want to look into any more in-depth information about this trip or any other of my painting adventures, you can go to my website, tobywrightfineart.com forward slash blog. And there you've got a bunch of different posts that I've written up with much more information than I may have skipped over in this particular video. So that's about it, and all I have uh, now is to offer you some completely gratuitous pictures of sea lions.